Starvation in Africa's richest country, the crisis the world has missed. Good evening, it's a disaster created by humanity through war and neglect. Tonight, we focus on a humanitarian crisis that amid the tragedies across the world has remained under the radar. But children in northern Nigeria are starving to death on a daily basis, and there are now all the ingredients for this to become a full-blown famine. In a country that produces two and a half million barrels of oil a day, Alex Thompson is there. Yes, we're in the northeast of Nigeria, where after the years of fighting between the government and Islamist rebels, starvation, yes, starvation is now a fact of life for some in the richest country in this continent. But away from that headline, there is a much wider and broader a humanitarian disaster unfolding. A UN official recently said 14, 14 million people in this region need humanitarian assistance urgently. Also tonight, Western leaders condemn Moscow for attacking civilians in Syria. Tens of thousands are in peril as Russia and the Syrian regime close in on Aleppo. But the ambassador to the UK accuses the rebels of using the city's people as human shields. They put the snipers on these humanitarian corridors and they are killing the people who are trying to escape. With the Prime Minister in Bahrain, her government bows to domestic pressure to publish its Brexit plan before formally withdrawing Britain from the EU. But Labour says the devil's in the detail. And Tata's plans to keep the home fires burning sees thousands of workers' jobs saved, but their pensions cut. And later, our second report on loneliness, new mothers far away from their families, the failures in childcare that find so many mothers lonely in their own homes. Tonight, the new report that details six life events that too often lead to loneliness. Although it's not a difficult thing to love someone else, it's difficult to love yourself when you're giving so much to that other person. It is the richest and most populous country in Africa, but parts of Nigeria are lurching towards a man-made famine as the Nigerian army drives out the Islamists of Boko Haram from the northeast of the country. It is uncovering the scale of destruction they have left behind. This is the province of Borno in northern Nigeria. The dark areas are still Boko Haram controlled. The regional capital, Maiduguri, is in government hands along with main roads like spokes from a hub. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, is in Maiduguri tonight. Alex. Yes, indeed, John. As you saw from the map, Madaguri pretty much surrounded still after all these years by Boko Haram territory. Now, nobody really knows what is going on out there, but it is a safe assumption that tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, possibly more than a million people are still beyond the reach either of, of the government or, of course, the NGOs to render them assistance. What we do know is, in terms of the numbers already here, already here more than two, up to about two million people displaced. So it's a crisis of huge dimensions. Quite rightly, the world's attention focuses, of course, on areas like Yemen and Syria, of course, in the Middle East, but unfolding below the headlines and, frankly, largely unreported. So that's something on a quite huge scale. To put it in some kind of context, the numbers of people who are in need of humanitarian assistance on a mid to long term is something like three times the entire population of Scotland, more than twice the population of London. That's what we're looking at from right here in the regional capital, Madugarai. A three-year-old girl lies in the grip of starvation. Hafisa Musa, another victim of Boko Haram's war, another child displaced by fighting not famine. We are currently managing her for severe malnutrition and then we are trying to rule out tuberculosis and HIV infection. So, and you have seen many, many cases like this? Many of such cases of recent, especially during this insurgency. This is my Dugari teaching hospital serving the whole of northeastern Nigeria. They have seen scores of cases of infant malnutrition. They've had to turn some away, some they couldn't save. In the high dependency ward, we come across two-year-old Mariam. She's on the left, recovering from skin lesions caused again by malnutrition. Just across town in Maiduguri, babies are being weighed. It's an everyday task in the few emergency clinics in this city. This one is run by MSF. 
We have cases like uh, malnutrition with tuberculosis, like with the TB. We have malnutrition with severe pneumonia. We have malnutrition with severe anemia. So when they come in, what we do, according to the severity of the illness, we evaluate them. We take care of the illness and at the same time taking care of nutritional needs. Nine-month-old Ibrahim Hawe just made it. His mum got him here just in time. Now Dr. Pinder says we are winning in this case. So too with Mohammed, a year old, in the bed opposite. His mother was left homeless because of the Boko Haram fighting, but made it to a camp in time. Maiduguri remains a relatively secure island surrounded by hostile Boko Haram territory, except for the main cross-country roads. Even in town, motorbikes are banned. Boko Haram use them for suicide bomb attacks. Flying east towards Lake Chad, flying high to avoid any incoming fire, and following the road, a relatively safe zone. On the ground, the Nigerian army is burning the bush, clearing fire points to attack Boko Haram. The numbers are unimaginable. The UN is now talking about 14 million people in need of humanitarian support. That's almost twice the population of London, almost three times the population of Scotland. This is Gamboro camp near Nagala, and there are scores more of these. 56,000 people live here. The Boko Haram threat ever present even now. The only way we could move securely was with the Nigerian army escort. A perfect storm has erupted for these people, their lives disrupted by the fighting with Boko Haram on the one hand. Long-term problems, climate change, the reduction in the size of Lake Chad, making their lives ever more difficult. And you have to see it, the sheer numbers of population here, the numbers of children, it all makes for a sustainability of life here, which can't happen without international aid under present circumstances. Suddenly, Guruga Yahaya leads us to his family's tent. They've been here for three years. Tonight, 25 women and children will sleep in here. He won't forget the day Boko Haram fighters came to his village. They bent down over my children and killed eight of them. Bang, 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 went the guns, he says. They were being shot by a gun. Yes. Whilst we saw no actual evidence of starvation here, the need for support for people is desperate and obvious. It's a long trek, for instance, to the sole water supply here. This is it for 56,000 people. In Ngala, the nearest town, this tented camp, the only medical facility for 140,000 people. Yet another mother, yet another little boy, yet another case of whooping cough. Ultimately, this will only end when people feel able to go home because there's genuine security. This is how the army sees it. We have decimated Boko Haram. We have um, degraded their capacity to fight. And um, uh, we just have a couple of reports here and there, but uh, they are no longer a formidable force they used to be. So it's not simplistic, it's the reality on the ground. They are gone. If that's so, why are these people still in the camp? Why haven't they gone home? Yeah, it, it, it's a process. You could recall that there was a time this camp was housing about 80,000 people. Now there are 56,000. Yet new people still come to this camp every day. And let me say it again, at least 40 more camps like this now exist. And what of the tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands, still out there in the bush, beyond the reach of the NGOs and the Nigerian army, where Boko Haram still holds sway? Well, I'm joined now by Maureen Gallagher, who's a nutrition expert for UNICEF here in Madugurai. Um, Maureen, you've got a lot of experience here. Um, when people in the UK see the pictures that we've sent tonight and they see babies suffering malnutrition, they think Africa, they think famine in many cases. It's not that simple, is it? Um, no, it's not. This area of Nigeria has been affected by poverty for it's the poorest area of Nigeria. And now um, with the Boko Haram conflict, it's just further aggravated. Families are displaced. Um, they don't have access to their livelihood zones. Farmers can't plant. Um, now his harvest season was just about two months ago and they weren't able to harvest, which means another year until um, food, pro food production is, is accessible. And so... Well, that's, that's not a detail, is it? They can't no, plant. Yeah. The next harvest is going to be, well, 
by what you just said next autumn. Mm -hmm. At the latest, there's another year of this now to get through with these kinds of numbers displaced. So we just have to make sure um, that food is accessible to people, that it's available, um, and that we're able to respond to the crisis. And in terms of that response, from your hard end of it, nutrition, um, clearly uh, babies, youngsters in, in mortal danger in some cases, adults too, though, let's face it. What are the, what are the primary needs? Um, we need to make sure that we're ready to respond. UNICEF has been responding now um, since the beginning of the conflict. We've been in many areas present providing, together with health services, nutrition, water sanitation, some of the basic needs that, if they're also provided, um, can prevent a child from becoming malnourished. Um, but in order to further respond and be able to scale up and provide higher coverage of, of services, um, we need to ensure that everyone that comes in works together, that we really work on a common response and that we're able to reach and have access to areas. I think that's been one big constraint that we've found. Right, it is. I mean, you say access to these areas out there, all around this city. We, we show people the map tonight of, of Maduro being like the, the centre, an island. Mm -hmm. You can get out safely along the main roads in theory. All around that, though, Boko Haram territory. What could be going on out there? We just don't know, do we? We don't. We just know that um, communities have been abandoned. Um, people have moved into camps to try and have some access to basic services because they're in need. And that's what we know. And we have to be able to get to other areas where people may not have been able to leave. And mercifully, at least this is a rich country, richest in Africa, strong government infrastructure in many ways, strong army. There, there is an infrastructure there potentially to get this right, but it's got to be big and long-term and concerted, right? Absolutely. And I think... Um, in the provision of assistance and being able to bring together the minimum health and nutrition package, um, working with partners, um, but through government, ensuring government is leading this, um, this movement can really get it right and apply lessons learned maybe from other humanitarian causes. Right. This is clearly, in terms of the harvest point that we mentioned, this is not going to go away, though. This is a crisis now. This will be a crisis for at least another year. At least another year, if not more. I mean, it's until we know when can we access new areas where we really don't know what's going on, um, and we already see the need in accessible areas, so just imagine what might happen happen, what might be happening in areas that aren't accessible. Right. Well, the dimensions are truly formidable. It's a colossal potential crisis. It is clearly not going to go away. Back to you in London. Thanks, Alex. Well, now to a sadly more familiar tragedy, which continues to unfold in the Syrian city of Aleppo. Rebels today withdrew from the old city, allowing government forces to move in. But tens of thousands of civilians are still trapped in the remaining rebel-held areas. Rebels now virtually admitting defeat and calling for a five-day ceasefire to allow for humanitarian aid and evacuations. And just to warn you, this report from Porrick O'Brien does include distressing images from the start. Paradise in Islam is under the feet of the mother. Saba Muhammad in a wheelchair, her feet dragging along the ground of the Al Shar neighborhood, recaptured yesterday. Her husband went out for medical help. The couple's seven sons are missing. This is the situation in Aleppo ceaseless shelling and rocket attacks. Our home was damaged in the attacks. We don't know where our children are. Some good people who welcomed us here have said they will take us to hospital for treatment. The tragic, and in this couple's case, fatal irony, this used to be Aleppo's medical district. They didn't find help, and Saba Mohammed passed away. As pro-Assad forces move through East Aleppo, opposition districts are falling like dominoes now. And out of the ashes, the elderly and the frail leave what's left. The scenario on the ground is changing rapidly. Overnight, all of the old city recaptured. This is a rough indication of how the rebel-held area has shrunk in the last 24 hours. Channel 4 News here. This morning, we asked a pro-regime Aleppo MP for his reading of the situation on the ground. And more and more uh, neighborhoods are being liberated as we speak. And how many neighborhoods would you say are left in that area? I would say I would say four or five neighborhoods maximum. How many people do you think are there in those four or five neighborhoods now? I would assume that uh, the remaining areas will be around twenty to thirty thousand, or, or or much less than that. I really don't know. Opposition fighters have called for a five-day truce to evacuate civilians in what's left. The Syrian government, though, see that as a chance for them to regroup. In the middle of this desperate catch-22, doctors and nurses. 
Medical facilities have been targeted, staff dubbed as terrorists. We're in contact with a group of doctors and nurses on the ground, and this is part of an instant message exchange between them today. 60% of besieged Aleppo is fallen. No, it's 70%. Where is the world? The regime is going to butcher all of us. Now they are bombing with the most vicious weapons. Buildings are turning into heaps of rubble in an instant. The problem is not death. The problem is if we are captured. People have given up. Part of the focus now is on what will happen to them. Uh, the doctors, they are of no concern to us. They are, if they are civilian doctors, there is a reconciliation process. But if they refuse to go through the reconciliation process, then they will be dealt with in the Syrian law with regards to uh, aiding terrorism. The reconciliation process will sound like something else to many of those left in East Aleppo. The MP explained it to us as a two days screening program. The rapidly moving front line has moved away from these neighborhoods in West Aleppo, filmed by pro government television. Families take to the balcony, children wave to camera. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to Alexander Yakovenko, the Russian ambassador to the UK. I began by asking him how long he expected the Russian operation in Aleppo to continue. So we're basically uh, expecting that uh, Aleppo uh, will be taken by the, uh, by the Syrian army uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, Are we talking weeks or...? It's very difficult because they're trying to do their uh, best to avoid the casualties. And uh, that's why it's very slow. Uh, we're not bombing the uh, eastern part of Aleppo for almost a month. And um, the key priority is to save the lives, try to, uh, try to provide the uh, escape of the people from the eastern Aleppo and to free the quarters. So it's, this is the task. Foreign Minister Lavrov said recently that terrorists in Aleppo will be destroyed if they, quote, refuse to leave nicely. What about the teachers and doctors? Do they face the same fate too? Of course not. <laughs> they're not fighting. They're, they're helping the people. We need these doctors who are in eastern Aleppo and the teachers. I mean, this is the people, this is the civilians. They have nothing to do with the, with the terrorists. What guarantees do doctors and teachers there have that they will be treated differently from the terrorists? Of course, of course. This is the civilians. This is just the regular people. You know, they're not fighting. And uh, we opened six humanitarian corridors uh, to let the people escape. But why should they trust your promises on the humanitarian corridors when you've been bombing them? I mean, would you trust someone to give you safe passage if they've bombed you? First of all, we didn't bomb the civilians. Uh, we were fighting with the jihadists. Well, thousands of civilians have died no, because of Russian airstrikes. It's not, it's not confirmed. There is no proof. I, by the way, I've, I formally asked the Secretary of State to give us the proofs and we still didn't receive any answer. Well, the Syrian Network for Human Rights, which is endorsed by the UN, says that the Russians have killed more Syrian civilians than ISIS. It's not three, three and a half thousand. Yeah, it's not supported by any evidences. That's the problem. You may dispute the numbers. You may dispute that three and a half thousand figure. But surely you don't dispute that some civilians have died because of Russian airstrikes. So you want me to talk about the collateral damage that was invented by the United States? Yeah, that's what uh, you yeah I don't have any figures on that, but what, uh, we'll be happy uh, just to have them. Let me read you a tweet from a, a seven-year-old who is stuck in Aleppo. Um, Bana Alabad said on Monday, she tweeted, under attack, nowhere to go, every minute feels like death. Pray for us, goodbye. Does that give you pause for thought that your country's it's, involvement is terrorizing it's, the Philippines? It's terrible, and I'll tell you, uh, they are stuck and they are, they are just surrounded by the jihadists. And um, uh, you know that what's the difference between the position of, the, uh, of Russia and the UK on Syrian crisis? We're trying to liberate the people. What's the position of the UK? Ceasefire? Let the jihadists wait, take a breath, and let the people uh, be killed by the jihadists, you know, today in the East Aleppo. This is the difference. Do you think the jihadis are preventing civilians from leaving? Yes. Moreover, they put the snipers on these humanitarian corridors and they are killing the people who are trying to escape. 
Where's your proof for that? Well, it's just we're part of that operation. We are just uh, supervising this, you know, we're, we're tracking this from the different angles, you know. You have to trust us because, you know, we're trying to, f to, f to free people, not somebody else. On President Trump, President-elect Trump, uh, President Putin was quoted as saying that he was a bright man. Some people have been confused over the translation there. Was he meaning he's a colourful man or an intelligent man? I don't know what he, what he meant. What I want to say, what, what I know, is there was a good conversation. And uh, the, both of them stated that um, uh, Russian-American relations are not in very good shape. And we have uh, to uh, change the situation. And of course, we're waiting for, for the new opportunities. It's very helpful to have a friend in the White House, isn't it? I mean, is that why, according to 17 US intelligence agencies, Russia interfered in the US election by handing over hacked information to WikiLeaks? Yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting subject because I carefully track this and uh, we asked the proofs of that and on official level it was never proved. The 17 US because, intelligence you know, it's, agencies? Uh, the media really um, uh, just exaggerated this question and tried to blame Russia. Because, you know, if you look the, uh, you look at the Britain, I remember the, a lot of stories that uh, Brexit is, uh, is very useful for Russia, is good for Putin, and all this, this kind of uh, stories. So this is some kind of a really uh, dirty game. Uh, and uh, uh, what really puzzles me is just why it's done. Because, you know, we're not part of the political landscape in the United States. But uh, we were blamed for everything, almost for everything. It's not just about the election campaign. You, you just name it. Russia is guilty. <laughs> the Russian ambassador to London. Now, they've been under threat for the last nine months, but today a potential deal has been unveiled to save most of Britain's Tata steelworks. The unions at the Port Talbot plant in South Wales say that the plan could secure jobs for years to come and bring serious investment for the future. Our correspondent Andy Davis is in Port Talbot tonight. Andy. Well, first of all, let's rewind nine months and you will recall the steel industry in Britain being plunged into crisis when Tata Steel announced that it was looking to sell its UK operations and suddenly thousands of jobs were at stake with governments from Westminster to Cardiff under a huge amount of pressure to step in. Now today, Tata have come out and stated explicitly that as long as its business here is solvent, important caveat, it wants to hold on to almost all of its sites in the UK. Now that's due in part to much more favourable economic conditions for steelmaking in the UK, but it's a commitment to stay here. It's a commitment to invest hundreds of millions across its UK sites and a commitment to keep the blast furnaces behind me, the very beating heart of the steelworks in Port Talbot, open for at least another five years. And when you look back on the uncertainties of the last year, well, it is quite some turnaround. Well, now, the unions have been heavily involved in talks with Tata in the run-up to all this. Uh, is there a trade-off? Uh, there is, John. It is a quid pro quo, and it's a significant one. The steelworkers here are being told that they've essentially got to move away from their current final salary pension scheme, which most of them are on, to a new, less generous, defined contribution scheme. And as the General Secretary of the Main Steelworkers Union pointed out to me today, that, for a lot of them, is going to be hard to stomach. I think, inevitably, there will be people tonight who will be, you know, extremely worried, concerned, and uh, unsure about what the future holds in terms of the British Steel Pension Scheme. But we are, you, are you urging them to accept this proposal? I believe that this is, this is the best possible proposal we can get, and I also believe that we would have to face the challenges of the British Steel Pension Scheme, irrespective of, of what we've secured with regards to jobs and production. So that'll be put to a ballot in the new year. I've spoken to several steel workers tonight, one of whom said, this isn't ideal on the pensions, but we've been backed into a corner. As for Tata, well, the boss of their UK operations was giving interviews this evening, and I asked him what message he had for those communities who have been deeply unsettled over the last nine months by his company's original decision to consider selling up. The, our future is in our hands, and the communities and the employees they understand it. It is a time of the year when they should feel more secure than what they have felt in the past. And 
all the best wishes for Christmas. So there's a long way to go here and anything can happen in this industry. But the sight of a Tatar executive standing outside Potolba talking about its future and wishing everyone a happy Christmas, well, nine months ago, few here could have predicted that. Andy Davis in Potolba. Cathy. Thanks, John. Now, she's the first woman ever to attend a summit of Gulf Arab states. Pursuing her charm offensive on countries outside the EU, Theresa May told the Gulf Cooperation Council she wanted to build on the trade and investment relationship between Britain and the Gulf. But she also pledged to stand alongside them against the aggressive regional actions, as she put it, of Iran. Our Asia correspondent, Jonathan Miller, has this report. Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Flying the flag of not grey but her red, white and blue Brexit, the Prime Minister made a grand entrance at Sakir al Amr Palace for the Six Nations Summit in the tiny island kingdom of Bahrain. Theresa May, the first British PM and the first ever woman to address the Gulf Cooperation Council. She's under big pressure to turbocharge post-Brexit trade. And the wealthy Gulf kingdoms present high-value targets for Britain. The UK has been proudly at the forefront of a relationship between the Gulf and the West that has been the bedrock of our shared prosperity and security. And as the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, I am determined that we should seize the opportunity to get out into the world and to shape an even bigger global role for my country. I seek not just to offer a message of continuity, but to begin to build a new, bold new chapter in our cooperation. I'm determined that we should do everything possible to build on this and elevate our trade and investment to an even more ambitious level. Among the few things that unite these Gulf nations is their shared status as serial human rights abusers. This has been denounced as the shabby face of Brexit human rights concerns sacrificed on the altar of commerce. Take the regional heavyweight, Saudi Arabia. Mrs May met King Salman today. She was, it's reported, good to her word in raising concerns over the Saudi-led war in Yemen. Not only backed by Britain, but enabled by British arms exports. Three billion pounds worth of licenses granted to Saudi since the bombing began 18 months ago. 11,000 civilians dead or injured and the head of the UN there warning today that the world is ignoring a full-blown humanitarian emergency. Ironic King Salman meeting a female British Prime Minister. In Saudi, women aren't even permitted to drive. And then there's the torture and beheadings, children among those executed this year. Mrs May's host here is King Hamad of Bahrain. His Sunni minority regime is repressive. A crackdown on Shia-led pro-democracy protests blew up in 2011 but continues unabated today. Protesters, opposition politicians and journalists jailed. This pro-democracy activist, Mohammed Ramadan, a father of three, is facing imminent execution, having allegedly been tortured into making a confession. A correspondent from the Qatar-based, Qatar-funded news channel Al Jazeera was refused entry to Bahrain to cover the summit because Al Jazeera had covered the crackdown. But Qatar itself, notorious for the mistreatment of foreign laborers, building stadiums for the 2022 World Cup, hundreds have died. The other three Gulf summit nations, Kuwait, Oman and the United Arab Emirates, are all accused of serious human rights abuse too. She says she's going to raise it, but where's the evidence of that? She says that uh, UK uh, is backing reforms in the country proposed by these Gulf countries. We haven't seen that. What she should be doing is uh, recognising and, and saying, I'm hearing what you're saying, and of course these human rights issues will be discussed. We have long-standing relationships with the Gulf. That enables us to engage with them on difficult issues like human rights, but it's only because of those relationships that we're able to do that. Critics of Theresa May's post-Brexit sales pitch say the shot on the arm for British trade in the region risks undermining the values which Britain supposedly holds dear. Well, Mrs May's trip to Bahrain has meant that she missed today's big set-piece Commons debate on Brexit. 
but she'd managed to draw the teeth from the opposition motion by agreeing in advance to publish a statement of the government's plans before moving Article 50. MPs have been voting in the last few minutes, so let's join our political editor, Gary Gibbon, in the central lobby of Parliament. Gary, what's happened? Well, Theresa May missing this vote at one point looked as though that might make things touch and go in the last few days, but the government uh, caved in as the oppos opposition see it, and they've actually won the first vote here by 372, and that is a kind of a milestone because that is a vote on the government amendment which says that all those MPs believe that Article 50 and uh, notice to leave the EU should be invoked by the end of March. So it is a bit of a moment. Labour's turning around saying actually it's their moment because they forced the government to, uh, in order to contain that rebellion, to back their demands for a plan uh, on Brexit and how that plan should be brought forward early. But David Davis, the Secretary of State for exiting the EU, when he was speaking to the House, sounded like a man who wasn't about to bring forward what you or I would probably think of as a plan, but actually might make a few more statements uh, to the House along the lines probably of what he'd always considered making. There was a real brittleness uh, to this debate, not least on the Tory benches. A couple of moments uh, particularly stood out. One uh, Tory MP, former Attorney General Dominic Grieve, implying, he didn't actually name him, uh, but implying that Sajid Javid, uh, still in the Cabinet, uh, had uh, been uh, pretty offensive in the way that he'd suggested that people who were voting the way uh, they were, ob objecting to some uh, aspects of, of Brexit, were in some way being undemocratic. Oliver Letwin, former uh, member of the Cabinet, um, saying that actually if MPs keep demanding more information, it could be a disaster for the entire project. Here's a, a flavour of two different Tory MPs uh, in their different ways responding to the idea that MPs need more information on this. The government must have the flexibility to adjust during negotiations. It's like threading the eye of a needle. If you've got a good, a good eye and a, and a steady hand, it's easy enough. If somebody jogs your elbow, it's harder. If 650 people jog your elbow, it's very much harder. Uh, the language used is the rather vague one of a plan. Well, we'll probably be told the plan is to have a red, white and blue Brexit. We need a white paper, a strategy, votes in this House and clarity on policy. Well, on a different subject, Theresa May has given a rather interesting interview in The Spectator, hasn't she, where she's revealed some frustrations about Whitehall. Tell us about that. Not unrelated, I think. Not that different, because she's saying in this interview that uh, she thinks that some civil servants don't tell her uh, what she needs to hear. Don't tell me... Uh, she's saying in telling them, tell me what you think, uh, and not don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Now, uh, this goes to the heart of uh, an awful lot of complaints you hear wandering around uh, Whitehall, that a lot of civil servants feel a little bit intimidated by what is seen by some as a slightly authoritarian approach by some of her chief aides to people who bring advice. You normally have to wait quite a while for a new prime minister to slightly fall out with the civil service. Uh, we're not very far into this administration and there's some signs of very real tension. Indeed. Gary, thank you very much. John. Well, the government's already lost one MP over its stance on Article 50 after Stephen Phillips resigned the Lincolnshire seat of Sleaford and North Highcombe in protest at the government's reluctance to allow a, common, a Commons vote. Tomorrow, residents in the pro-Brexit stronghold go to the polls to elect his successor. But rather than worry about the political process, a key concern here is a lack of progress in actually leaving the EU, as our political correspondent Michael Crick now reports. Like Richmond, it had a 20,000-plus Tory majority in 2015. But it's hard to find an English seat more different than Sleaford and North Highcombe. It's a huge chunk of Lincolnshire, Brexit country. They don't really like what we think, do they? And targeted much more by UKIP these days than by Labour or the Lib Dems. But Nigel Farage's trip this week was rather spoilt by standing next to a UKIP banner on which Highcombe was misspelt Heikenham. Oh dear. <laughs> now we're looking for this place, uh, North Heikenham. Can you tell, help us where it is? Oh, come on. Don't be like that. Victoria Ailing has stood for the Tories in the past and UKIP. On the doorsteps, there's a lot of anger with the government who feel they've been conned. Remember, this is a very much an out constituency. 62% voted out. They feel there's backsliding. They voted Brexit here because they wanted to control our borders. They wanted to stop paying in billions a month to be a member of a club. And they wanted to stop all the red tape. 
And indeed, as MPs debated Brexit today, many in this part of Lincolnshire are urging them to get a move on. How do you think the, the Brexit thing's going? It's going rotten at the moment. Slow. It's very slow. I think the sooner we get out, the better. A bit slow. A bit slow. You think they should get a move on? Yes. And they closed down the A and E. It may be Labour should be the challenger in, here, having been second here. last well, time. Thanks. Now, Thanks. yesterday, Lord Prescott, UKIP misspelled Tycom. Tycom. Yeah. <laughs> and now you've done, done end, it. You've done it on your own leaflet. Look. Amazingly, <laughs> Labour misspelled Tycom too, with an extra H in the middle. This is just a draft copy. Jim Clark, a dustman, voted Remain, but now he too wants to get on with Brexit. You voted to Remain? Yep. You're absolutely sure of that? Yeah, I am. Well, yeah. But now you think uh, it should be hurried up, do you? I think you need to respect the will of the vote, like the voter, and the, and the people around here voted out, and yeah, it should be. We're just doing dallying about, aren't we? Theresa May's got no plan for Brexit, there's no idea, so let's get on with the job and get, on to, get to do Article 15 and get the negotiations going. Good morning. The Lib Dems, fourth last time, say theirs is the only one of ten candidates pledged to remain. We have got a large proportion of the population here in Sleaford and North Highcombe who voted to remain and they are not being listened to. But a greater part of the population voted Brexit uh, and they want the government to get on with it. But you still have a significant proportion of people who voted remain and in a democracy everyone should be listened to. There we are, there's the enemy. John Prescott <laughs> yesterday wasn't the only visitor barred from talking to the Conservative candidate. I'm afraid not she is, but... Oh, I tell her I called, I'm sad to have missed her. So, were we? Time and again, the Tories said they'd get back to us. Then, just before two o'clock this afternoon, they said she couldn't help us. She was busy all afternoon with personal engagements. So instead, Here's some of an interview she did with ITV. What do you think Brexit should look like? OK, well, I voted to leave the European Union. Yeah. And I think the main issues uh, there were ensuring that we have uh, control as a country of, of our own destiny and that we are able to get the best deal for all the people of Sleaford and North Highcombe and for the rest of the people of the UK. Does that mean staying in the single market? Well, I don't think it's at this stage helpful to negotiate to talk about the details of the negotiation. Caroline Johnson should win here. The interesting fight for second. Can the Lib Dems keep up some momentum from Whitney and Richmond? Equally, can Labour bounce back? And how will UKIP do under a new leader in what should be a promising patch? Michael Crick, Channel 4 News in Foggy, Sleaford and North Highcombe, with one H and no N in the middle. And this is the full list of candidates for the Sleaford and North Highcombe by-election. Voting takes place tomorrow. The Liberal Democrats have been hit with the maximum £20,000 fine by the Electoral Commission for failing properly to declare all their spending in last year's general election. The Commission found that more than £180,000 of payments during the campaign were missing without a reasonable excuse. It said the party had failed to meet the basic requirements of the law and has referred the matter to the police. The Lib Dems blamed human error and failures of process. The drug company Pfizer has been handed a record fine of more than £84 million over excessive and unfair pricing. The Competition and Markets Authority imposed the penalty after the firm raised the price of an anti-epilepsy drug to the NHS by 2,600%. Pfizer rejected the decision and plans to appeal. After the break, the loneliness of becoming a new mum. In part two of our series, we look at how women feel isolated, alone and depressed after giving up work to look after baby. This week, we are looking at loneliness and how it can affect people across the generations. Research to be published tomorrow by the Co-op and the British Red Cross identifies six life events that can lead to someone becoming lonely, including retirement, bereavement and becoming a new mum. 
In fact, when we asked for mothers to talk to us, we were overwhelmed with hundreds of responses. Our health and social care correspondent, Victoria MacDonald, went to meet two of them. Okay, you'll go to bed on time. When you're at home, obviously, it's, you can be talking to this little person for hours each day and it won't be talking back to you. You realise that you've gone a whole day without actually having a proper conversation about you. If I went out, I'd be panicking. So you start to think, is there something wrong in, like, in my head, in my body? Am I, you know, am I ill? Or is it just this feeling of loneliness, you know, emptiness as well? You're told when you become a new mum about the joy, the love, the bond with your baby. You're even warned about the sleepless nights or the trouble feeding. But who tells you about the loneliness? If he's crying, I get really stressed because you don't want to look like you're a bad mum. So I think I probably stop myself going out more because I don't want people to look at us and judge us for whatever. Um, so I sort of trap myself in this house more than I should. And yeah, I, I think I find it quite a safe, quite a safe environment, but it's also very lonely because it's just me and Teddy. And yeah, it can be quite, quite limiting. Jess Bowen is 23, mother to eight month old Teddy. The first of her friends to have a baby her partner is at work all day. She feels young and insecure and unconfident. When I feel most lonely is when I'm at a mother and baby group and everyone's there talking about how amazing it is being a mum and I'm just sat there going, but I, I had a two hours sleep and I had like a really rubbish night and I think I feel most lonely when I just, because I don't know them and I can't relax and tell them everything that I'm thinking. It's. I think that is when I feel most lonely, not when I'm sat in this house with Teddy. When we asked to speak to some new mothers about loneliness, we were overwhelmed with the response, 270 in just a few days. And tomorrow the co-op and British Red Cross will unveil research that shows loneliness can be triggered by life events, including becoming a new mum. And the common thread? Surprise that motherhood isn't all hearts and flowers. The loss of identity and often postnatal depression clearly fueling the anxiety and isolation. I wish I had realised that motherhood was not going to be this breeze. It's, although it's not a difficult thing to love someone else, it's difficult to love yourself when you're giving so much to that other person. And I, I don't think it's, I don't think it should be an embarrassing thing. I just don't see why I should be embarrassed about the fact that it's not easy. Libby Tanner is a mother and stepmother to Ned and Gwen. And where Jess frets about how young she is, Libby says at 39 she feels the opposite. I live in an area where there is a lot of younger mums. So when I did access a few of the children's centre activities, I felt ancient. I know, you don't like going in here, do you? <laughs> when you meet a younger mum, so 20s and things, I almost feel then that I need to mother them, which is really patronising and I don't mean it to be, but just haven't got as much in common with them. Three. And so it was easier for her to stay at home. Four. You can feel like a prisoner in your own, in your own home, but I made myself like that, you know. The door was open, I could have gone out, but... I wanted to stay in. It was, it was my safety. It was the secure, or security of being in my home. So, and the days could be long, very long. But you just waited for your husband's walking. Bless him. <laughs> Social media is another common theme, often a replacement for human interaction. I used social media a lot. It was my connection with the outside world. Um, Do you think it stopped you connecting with real people? Probably, but on that you can then put on a front and you can be having a horrendous day, feeling 
slow, low, so lonely, the baby's crying. But for the two seconds where the baby's smiling, you take a photo and go, look at how wonderful my life is. Aren't I lucky, you know? And that's what people see, and that's what I put out, so that, you know, because you can't be seen to be, you know, struggling. I felt ungrateful because I have this beautiful baby that was bonny and healthy and some, something that I never thought I'd have. And I did, and I was blessed, and and yet there I was, you know, not begrudging he was there, but just sometimes missing my old life or missing who I was. A blessing, but I'm lonely. Well, we're joined now by Lord Victor Adebawale, CEO of the charity Turning Point, and a non-executive director of the co-op who helped to commission this report, and also by Katie Massey-Taylor, a mum who found having a baby so lonely that she set up an app to help herself and others find friends. And from Westminster by the Conservative MP Maria Caulfield, who is a former nurse and a member of the Women and Equalities Commission, Committee. Um, let's start with you, Katie Massey-Taylor. Just tell us, what did you experience that led you to set up this app and what happened? So I was, um, I, I was amazed by how lonely I felt when I had small kids. Uh, they're very long days uh, by yourself and your loving husbands and friends, they're, they're, they, they're, they go off to work um, and you've got long days to fill. And uh, I found it really hard to meet friends nearby um, who had kids the same age and shared the same interests. And in fact, it was a chance meeting with another mum in the playground that kept me sane during that whole sort of period of having small kids. And, we thought it shouldn't be chance encounters that lead mums to, to find other friends nearby. Mm. So let's do something about it. Uh, so we raised investment to uh, set up a, an app. Uh, it's a free app called Mush. And it's very simple. You can find mums nearby with kids the same age. Mm. And um, 35,000 mums have signed up to it since we launched in April uh, with very little uh, marketing spend at all. So, I mean, the need is there. And we're thrilled that we're making such a difference. Mm. We've been described as a lifesaver by various mm. mums, um, which is fantastic. Maria Caulfield, this is actually something which hasn't been often publicly discussed on this scale. Um, I mean, does the government recognise that there is a problem of loneliness in this country? Well, I think the problem is underestimated, and I think that I really welcome the report because both as my experience of being a local constituency MP for quite a rural area, I come across a lot of young mums who've uh, given up work to have children or they're on maternity leave and do feel completely isolated and come and see me as their local MP for just help and advice on some very basic issues. But also from my experience of the Women and Equality Select Committee, we recently conducted a report on maternity discrimination, and some of these very themes came through quite strongly. And I think we were quite surprised by that. So this is very important uh, research that's been done and we do need to act on those findings. Lord Adebowale, um, what is staggering in your report is this estimate of nine million people in Britain yeah. feeling lonely. Yes, I think we are the, the lonely capital of Europe, as The Telegraph pointed out in one of its articles on loneliness. And, you know, when, when I looked at the work that the co had done, uh, we talked to, what, five million members? 70,000 colleagues, 35% of our members uh, knew someone who was suffering from chronic loneliness and, and isolation. And, you know, it's a very powerful cause of depression. I know from my work at Turning Point that it's also a, a, a pred predicator of mental illness, substance misuse, and the work that the Red Cross is doing is, but, with the co-op is identifying this as a real community need. You see, one anticipates it possibly in somebody who's socially disadvantaged, uh, badly housed or whatever, mm -hmm. but but that, that actually middle-class oh, yeah. mums, you know, yes. um, yeah. are suffering in well, large numbers. Well, I think it's interesting. I've just come from the, uh, a conference of health, health visitors and they will tell you that isolation and loneliness amongst young mothers is a huge predicator of mental illness and um, it, it crosses all classes. Um, loneliness and isolation in, in, in key points in, in life. So mm. uh, becoming a mother, um, uh, becoming a student, uh, leaving home, right. uh, retirement, uh, elderly, these are all sensitive points at which loneliness and isolation can begin. Well, um, Katie, Maria Caulfield uh, spelt out what her own committee has begun to, to do in terms of looking at the problem, but what would you want the government to actually do? And should the government do anything about it? Well, look, I mean, we know midwives and health visitors do a great job, uh, but they're, you know, spread thin. And uh, I suppose, you know, recommending services like ours as, as real solutions mm. to find 
people that they can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, peer support network. Mm -hmm. It's really because actually loneliness is, it, it's the trigger to, to get out and about and, and, and meet people and interact. And, and that's quite often, you know, can, can do the job of... But as well as the app, do you not need an agent in the community? I mean, you do. perhaps more uh, community nurses, I mean, many more, uh, yes. to start oh, tackling and uh, bring people together. It would be fantastic to have more, of course. I think a combination of the two would, would be the well, ideal situation. Well, let, let's try this on you, Maria Caulfield. I mean, nobody wants to hear that they want more public servants, but the truth is uh, that it sounds as if communities in Britain do need much more support. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, as a, a former nurse, I, I know that the difference that can make. And in the 1001 Critical Days report, which is a cross-party report uh, that looked at early years, um, it, the, one of the key recommendations was more health visitors uh, and more midwives to provide that initial support and to, tr to provide um, social support for, for women who are often on their own. And we know it's the first few years are often the toughest because you've lost your work network, um, your child's not yet started school, and so you're very, vulnerable at that stage so definitely health visitors uh, are more are needed to support women who find themselves in this situation uh, Katie I mean uh, the online world is not necessarily the the best place uh, to find company in the sense that a lot of mothers complained actually that it was partly because part of their lives was online yeah. and not actually touching people no and I absolutely I, I understand uh, this feeling that lots of people are having a better time than you you see it on social media I think the important thing is that you've got to find tools like ours that, mm. that help um, mm. to facilitate the offline meetups. Mm. It's not about spending your time communicating mm. online, it's about finding mums around the corner that you can talk to. Uh, and that's exactly what our product does. Victor, what will you be pressing the government to do? After all, you've got that prime position of being able to move around in the House of Lords. Well, yes, yeah, some say. I think, I think it's about recognition in the first instance. This is a serious problem that requires government. It's not just about more uh, nurses, although more nurses would be good, and it's not just about young mothers, it's about the elderly, it's about the young. So it is about more, but it's about and, and. So nine out of ten uh, of our members, the co-op members, think that the community groups can play a part in this. And the co-op has, what, 3,750 stores, we have a funeral service, we work with people who are bereaved. But I think what the government needs to do is recognise this as a social issue mm -hmm. and build it into their commissioning of services across the piece. Health, the... social care, education, policing crime. The problem is that it is about uh, the fact that we've become more mobile society. I mean, I don't know how near your family lived to you, but probably not very near. But uh, uh, here you have... Communities where all granny, more, grandpa, etc., exactly. miles away. All the more need for this kind of recognition that people do become isolated. We're talking in the elderly, um, three quarters of, of elderly people are chronically isolated and lonely. So we need to recognise it's an issue precisely because of what you've said. We need to engage, ensure that public services play their part, mm. but the government needs to encourage organisations like the Co-op, Red Cross, Turning Point, to work with the public Just, services. Mm. Just briefly, Maria Colville, do, do, do you intend to keep with this particular problem? Will you be Absolutely. pressing the government on it? Absolutely. I agree with all those points, but particularly for young mums, one of the key findings that we found was that although shared parental leave came into force last year, it's not been taken up, and it's often young mums who are left staying at home with their children, and actually if there was more of a sharing of that responsibility, it would at least break some of that, that cycle. And dads aren't taking up that offer at the moment, either because statutory maternity pay is too low, or because there's still a stigma about taking time off to have children. So absolutely, we need to follow this up and I'm so pleased that this research has brought this problem to light because I don't think enough people know right. uh, that that problem exists. Mar Maria Caulfield, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Victor Ad Adebowale, thank you for producing the report uh, and Katie, thank you too very much for talking to us. Kathy. That's all from us tonight. That's Channel 4 News. Good evening.